about barbecue is it's about celebration. It's about heritage. It's about family. When you think about going to a barbecue, that's what you're thinking about. I'm Andy Husbands. I am the pit master of the smoke shop, now in the seaport. I wanted to be a fancy chef. That was my goal. I think what drew me to barbecue is the competitions. We started competing in about 1997, and just the craft, the care. We do a reverse rub. It's a little trick we picked up in competition barbecue. Uh, our brisket rub is a mixture of salt and pepper and a few other secret things. We rub it with our secret rub, smoke it at about 250 degrees. That brisket, when we cooked it, was 18 pounds. By the time you got to cut it, it was about 10, 11 pounds. It's just intensified. So we do a St. Louis cut. It's a pork rib, uh, very, very meaty, rubbed with Grendon's rub, which is a mixture of spices and chilies. Sweet, salty, a couple secret ingredients in there. We rub them, smoke them for about four to six hours. We're using uh, oak and cherry, all coming from New Hampshire. Glaze them with our sweet victory sauce and a little more reverse rub. And that reverse rub makes really the flavors just kind of pop. Barbecue is, is to me, America's cuisine. It's very celebratory. It's such, such a, a really cool experience. My name is Andy Husbands. I am the pit master and owner of the Smoke Shop Barbecue. We have three locations now, but I'm in the works to opening another one right this moment. So soon to own four of them. And you know, what we do is bring you Boston's best barbecue in an inviting environment with some really great liquor. Oh, all right. So for anyone that's watching, I've known Andy since I started my career when I was 22 years old in radio. I love everything that this man does. He, I mean, there's so many different chefs that are around that people read about, that people see. And literally, you are by far one of my favorites. And I'm just going to start by saying that you, in the back in the day, 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 you created this amazing bread pudding that I still, to this day, whenever I go to any restaurant and I even taste bread pudding, I'm like, it's not like Andy's. So that's where I'm going to start this conversation about it's not like Andy's. So hi, my friend. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. I mean, I cannot complain. I mean, I'm living a very, very happy life. And I woke up this morning. So we woke up this morning. This is a good thing. I mean, I'm loving it. If you must know, I know things are crazy and I'm not downplaying it and I'm not worried. I am worried about everything, mm -hmm. but this is our life, right moment. This moment here, this is my life. So I'm going to enjoy it as possible as I can. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So, so, all right, we can like, we can sit there and talk about everything and we're going to talk about a lot of different things, but I want everyone to know who is Andy? Where did Andy come from? How did Andy get to the point where he was beloved by Jody and her and his bread pudding? So who what's the story of Andy? Wow, that's such a long thing. Perhaps <laughs> it should be a movie. Uh, um, um, so um, you know, I'm I was born in Seattle, Washington. Um, loving parents. Um, and you know, I definitely grew up in kind of a wacky wor world where my father was a uh, manager of bands, punk rock bands. This is the late 70s, um, you know, and he owned, he owned clubs and recording studios. So I think there is some kind of like thing about like throwing events that I maybe saw as a child. Uh, I always loved to cook in fourth grade. I made a, did a demo of how to make donuts. Uh, in when I was 14, I, my first job was in a bakery, you know, ironically, right? And it's just something I've always enjoyed. And just been very passionate about. I'm one of those people that, um, that you know, like I, I do what I want, right? Like every moment I'm doing what I want. My life has changed drastically, you know, since, uh, you know, those making those donuts when I was 14, but I've always been on kind of a trajectory to do something in the culinary field, you know, and I owned restaurants where, um, you know, I was the chef. I'm in there every day. I'm, I'm, personally cooking everything to now where, you know, pre-COVID we had 200 employees and I had three restaurants. So, um, you know, my job has changed. I'm more um, kind of leadership, um, team builder, coach, 
um, friend and, uh, you know, marketing ambassador, all that stuff. And it's, which is great. You know, you can say, well, Andy, do you want to cook? Actually, last night I did a vegan dinner, four course vegan dinner, five course vegan dinner, just for fun. Right. That was fun. I just did that. But really cooking at the restaurants is, isn't what I do anymore. Um, it's, I do love cooking, but um, as you get older, you kind of do more. And that's how I get here. Oh, see, this is like so funny how you skipped so much. So let's start at the beginning. Seattle, um, one of my favorite places. I have friends there every, I mean, literally like every year during this time is when I usually would be at Seattle seeing of the one, the first Seahawks game of the year. Um, yeah. which is one of the, the enjoyments of what I do, um, uh, kayaking and out there in the sound. And basically those seals are not afraid or intimidated by you. They just come right to the boats and just hang out. So how did the Seattle guy come into Massachusetts and was there anywhere in between? No, so my father actually uh, grew up in Needham, Massachusetts. And his father was ill, uh, and he wanted to come back and take, help take care of him. And it was just something that we did. Uh, I moved out with him. And um, so it's kind of like, you know, so, I'm sort of a loner. So, you know, he's like, you want to go do this? And I'm like, oh, that sounds fun. Um, wasn't probably, it was an interesting decision. Um, I, I don't regret it, but, uh, it, you know, I don't think I understood. There's a big difference, especially back then, between East Coast and West Coast, mm -hmm. um, besides, um uh, the Seahawks and uh, and Celtics, right? Uh, and uh, Patriots and uh, Sonics. Um, but I don't know. It just it kind of became a natural progression for me. And everything is, I'm a guy who walks down, who like, I think I want this. I really think I want this. And I'm so focused on getting this. Then all of a sudden I get this. And I'm like, oh, no, no, this is really what I wanted. So I'm able to like pivot in my mind very easily to different paths and different ways, which I think is in my business helps with success because I'm not just solely focused on one thing where I can't pivot and you need to, in, in the restaurant industry, you need to be able to pivot uh, minute by minute, hour by hour. Um, but we still have strategies. I don't want to think we don't have no, strategies. No, 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 no absolutely. And, and we'll definitely get there. It's, been, it's very interesting because you say that you're a loner. I only know you as bringing people together. I mean, restaurants are all about bringing people together, but you're a loner. I mean, is it, is it very similar to a comedian is on stage, they are like, you know, a laugh a minute, and then behind the scenes that they're an introvert? Is, is it very similar like that? Yeah, I would, I would say as more of a loner as a, as a, as a young child. Um, you know, it just took me a while to kind of identify who I was and how I was going to represent myself in life. You know, it just took a while. Like, it took a while to get my mind right in that. Um, I have a very, very small core group of friends. Most of them are not chefs, believe it or not. Um, you know, I think about food all day. I don't need to be with that with them. Um, so, you know, my friends are lawyers and consultants and all you name it. Um, so, um, what was the question you were asking me? Uh, <laughs> Introvert versus an extrovert. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I took that. I took the... Um, what you call it, the Briggs, the Meyer Briggs thing. And yeah, that's how I was like an extrovert introvert. So I am, I love the camera. I love to be on stage. I can talk to a thousand people and do a demo. But when I walk off stage, I need to be like alone. I, I, I'd like to be alone. That doesn't always happen. But yeah, you know, and when I say alone, I don't mean by myself. I mean, with my very, very core group of people who understand yep. me. And that's my family and my friends and stuff like that, you know. So how is it that um, that individual that in Seattle, you started young, started just baking, you're baking, and then you, mm -hmm. you come to the East Coast. Um, I mean, yes, for everyone that's ever seen it, done it dramatically different, um, cre and you're young. So how old were you at this point? I was 14 when I moved. Okay, so you're 14 years old. You come here, you're in school, so you have to like, you're, you're having to find your way. Um, that, that point of knowing that you're on the East Coast, finding your own way, and then evolving into a business owner. How did that happen? What, what is that? There's a, a gap that's missing for me. <laughs> so um, first of all, let's be clear, I wasn't the best student in high school. Um, and, uh, but I knew I wanted to go to college and that was important in my family. My family was like, you go to college kind of family. Um, and so, but I was continually working in restaurants restaurants. Um, I had a couple other jobs, which I failed miserably in, but mainly restaurants. And I loved it. I loved it. Um, you know, I had this memory as a, as a dishwasher at a place called Beacons on Route 1. And this is a long time ago. 
and I'm washing dishes, busy Saturday night, and I loved it. I loved every minute of washing dishes. You know, I'm like 16, and it was so cool. And the end of the night, the grill cook brought me over a prime rib with the au jus on it. I had never had it. And I was, I, I, you know, I'm like, what is this? This is the most amazing dish I've ever eaten in my life. And, um, you know, I had these memories of food and stuff. So anyway, um, I started applying for colleges. I applied to a bunch of them. Nobody accepted me except Johnson and Wales. And I was like, wow, I guess I'm going to college. Um, I kind of always knew I would. It wasn't like I ever thought I wouldn't, but I didn't really apply myself a lot. But when I got to college, college I went to Johnson and Wales University. I went for, and first of all, my father wasn't super psyched. He wanted me to be a lawyer or a minister. If you knew me very, very well, you'd know there's some like- I'm sorry, <laughs> Andy, Andy Minister. <laughs> well, to, to, to backstory, well, my, my grandfather's a very famous Unitarian. Okay. Uh, and, and my father was very involved in Unitarians. Uh, so that's what's his kind of thing. And I'm, if you know me, there's inherently some issues with that. Just so let's just leave it at that. That's not gonna work. Um, so he was pissed. He was like, I don't know. I don't know. Son of mine. I remember what he said. No, no son of mine is going to be a fry cook. He goes, you have to, um, I think I wasn't working at the time. So he's like, first of all, you need to get a job, another job in a restaurant. You need to work there and make sure this is what you want to do. And secondly, uh, you need to go for four years and you need to get a business degree. And I was like, perfect. That's what I wanted to do anyway. You know, um, I, something inside me knew, but you have to understand this is 1987. Most people did not know about, you know, single unit. There wasn't much on TV. There wasn't many single unit restaurants. I mean, there was. Nobody really talked about restaurants. 87 was a different time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, back then, I mean, Olives, uh, not Rialto, but its predecessor, Michaela's was around, Jasper's, Hammersley's, East Coast Grill mm -hmm. um, were around, but that was it. And they were still small and not these, you know, famous chef stuff. But... Um, when I got to Johnson Wales, I graduated magnum cum laude. I loved every minute of it. What I found out finally was, here is something I'm as good or better than most people. Mm -hmm. And I just loved it. And I studied hard. I partied hard. I cooked hard. I worked when I wasn't, um, you know, worked in restaurants when I wasn't um, uh, uh, in school. I just loved it. I loved every minute of it. And it was really just kind of we confirmed like, wow. And I, and I could see I was good or better than everybody, you know, not better than everybody, but as good or better than everybody. And I, you know, you don't walk out of Johnson Wells becoming a chef. You walk out of Johnson Wells being a very knowledgeable cook. And, you know, then I, um, I worked around in a bunch of places and then I moved to buy, I traveled Europe and came back to Boston and I worked, I was, the plan was to move to New York city and become a famous chef. But when I moved, went to Europe, I spent a lot, a lot of money. And I came back to a bill from my father, like, here's your credit card bill. And uh, which is, you know, it's nice that he, it's nice that he didn't let me go into debt. Uh, and unfortunate at the time that I had to pay him back. So I had to get a job. And my friend, I knew, knew somebody that worked at the East Coast Grill. And I went and applied for a job. I got a job as a prep cook. And within two months, I was the sous chef. And probably within six months, I was the chef of the place. Okay. And under, under my mentor, Chris Lessinger. And that was really um, a, a seismic shift in my life. Seismic. I understand, I started to understand more about community. Mm -hmm. I understand more about being a team player. Um, you know, I got mentored by this guy who is wildly successful and everything I ever wanted to be, he was. Um, so I decided to model my life after his, after him, you know, and I kind of went about it the same way. Um, and I, you know, that's kind of how I opened up my first restaurant in 1996, Tremont 647, which I owned for 21 years. So that's pretty good, right? Pretty proud of that. And um, what else happened? Um, I opened other restaurants in there, not so successful. So I've had some failures. And toward the end, uh, about year 18, um, to be very candid, you know, I did okay. I did good, right? I was doing good. I, you know, I'm not broke. I'm doing good, but not great. And I started to think about my retirement. Um, and, you know, for restaurants, there's not necessarily a, uh, a windfall, a cash out at the end. Um, so 
I mean, at the same time, I fell in love with a wonderful woman, Rice, my wife, R-I-C-E, that's her name. And um, that is really special in my life. And I think having a really strong partner in your life really can help you become even better than who you are. Mm -hmm. And she has enabled me to become stronger and better, which I love. And so therefore, um, you know, I don't know. I just knew it was time to make a change. And also, Trainmod 647, while I could have ran it for another 10 years and I still would have made money, it was cycling down. It wasn't the new hot, hip restaurant. I would do, you know, I, as you know, I do lots of charity. I believe in community. And, um, you know, I'd be at events and be like, oh, we never heard of you. And I'm like, I've uh, been there 20 years. You know, so like they, or the other one is, oh, we used to go there all the time. But now we live in Newton. Or now we live in Wellesley. You know, and so like all these people used to live in the city have moved out. And, you know, so I don't know. It just became time to do something new. And, and also, look, I did the same thing 20 years. You do something 20 years. You want to change. I wanted to change. At that time, I partnered up with a guy named Brian Lesser. I love the dude. Wait, wait, wait. We're going to pause. We're going to pause. I don't want you to go to the new business yet. Because I, I want uh, to a little bit. So, yeah. so 100% agree with you in regards to Johnson & Johnson. Um, my mother went there. My mother is Johnson and Johnson Wales. Like, Johnson & Wales. I'm so sorry. Johnson and Wales. Um, and um, it, phenomenal. Like, my mom is by far one of the most phenomenal chefs. Same thing. I mean, we're from Haiti. I can't get her to cook a Haitian meal to save up my life. Because she's like, I, go, I know how to do everything else. And then she went to France and she got another degree there. So 100%, the individual that you gaining the degree is one thing, but what are you going to do with it afterwards? Mm -hmm. um, every Sunday, pajama brunches at your place. I remember them very well. I mean, they were fun. I live in Marblehead. So when people ask me, like, I mean, it was like, I mean, I've been in Marblehead for 12 years and people ask me, they're like, I go, how often do you eat in the city? I'm like, I don't, like, I, I don't at all for any reason. So I get that whole entire, the group of individuals that grew up with you in your restaurant and grew up with you at all of, of all your stepping stones and how they evolved. Um, just a quick thing, like what do you do or what do you say to people that are having the same situation where they have their brick and mortar, it's a family owned business or it's their own business. And then people start growing away from them, not because they are not doing great business, but they're starting growing away. What would you say for them in regards of what should you do to pivot? What should you do to change? Um, obviously we're gonna talk about what you did, but what would be that advice that you'd say to someone that is like, wait, we used to have like people here all the time or people say, I've never heard of you before. That's a great question. And I'm not sure. I mean, I don't think I can broadly answer that because there's so many different variables. I'm thinking in my head of like, I would ask these people, but you need to, you, first of all, you need to always refresh them. So that's from simply painting, but through remodeling, right? Uh, and that's to the menu. And maybe even the service style. So you've got to always kind of refresh and re restart. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it depends. On the, and, and then it's like, but, you know, being a trendy restaurant is very hard. It's like having a, a, a top 40 hit, you know. Yeah. There are very, 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 very few people who can have multiple top 40 hits and then over multiple decades. It's impossible. It's really, really difficult. Generally, it's producers. Um, so uh, I just watched that Quincy Jones special. That's what made me think of it. Um, <laughs> He's amazing. Um, so I, I would say you need to take you. The hardest thing to do is to look in a look in the mirror and say, I own this. And so like when I deal with one of the things I deal with now is Google reviews. I do all the Google reviews. If you look at our Google reviews, you will see I've, re I've responded to every single one personally. You're not as good as your good best review and you're not as bad as your worst review. You're somewhere in between, but you need to own them all because they're your business. So back to what do I tell somebody? Look in the mirror, make sure you know you own it. You own the goods, the bads, the uglies, not just the touchdowns and go, is this okay with me? And it may be time to close. And that was a hard decision for me. It took me three years to make that decision. You know, I love Tremont 647. I was 26 when I opened it. You, so much craziness and fun and excitement and sad and awful things happened while I had that restaurant. Mm -hmm. You know, we had 9-11, we had bombings, we had snowstorms of 10 feet, we had births, we had marriages, we had weddings, we had everything, you know? So it's, man, it was hard. But sometimes you got to make that decision. Was it, you said it took three years. Sometimes you hear from people all the time where um, I should, actually, you know what? It was like um, Denzel, Denzel Washington said it. Um, during an interview where I stayed at, I stayed on St. Elsewhere one year too long. So 
was it three years of making the decision and it should have been two years or one year or was it three years was a perfect time for you to develop the exit strategy? It was the exit strategy was the hardest, but it was, it was, um, it needed a bunch of other people involved in it. So I'm not necessarily a guy who says, oh, it should have been some way. It is what it is, you know, and I'm not like, it is what it is kind of guy saying what happened is how it happened. I can't, I, well, I go back and say, well, that should have been a different way. I can't, yeah. you know what I mean? So, you know, I deal with what happens. I take it and I go. And, you know, it worked out great. It, personally, it worked out great. You know, it's fine. Would I, like it, would, I, would I have liked it to have been sooner? Yes. Was it sooner? No. But I'm a hardworking guy. And if, if I can get it done, I'm going to get it done. And so you exit from Fremont very, very well. We, again, I, I remember the days. I remember how good, oh my God, the food, everything, fantastic. The service, I mean, everything about it, I just remember it so well, so clearly. It was literally my, the early, the start of my career in Boston. Um, yep. What was your next place? I mean, what was the good about it and what was the bad about it? Because you already had that reputation that everyone knew and loved you. I mean, still. Well, so, so within the, within the um, Tremont 647 years, the mm -hmm. first 12 years, I had two other restaurants. Okay. Rouge, which was a, a kind of a southern-ish restaurant, uh, about two blocks away from Tremont Six Four Seven, and then I also had Kestrel, K E S T R A L, and that was in Providence, Rhode Island. And how were those experiences after and during Tremont? They were awful. <laughs> uh, so I mean, I lost hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds of but thousands. But the thing is, I go, so this is, I think this is where people um, are not understanding um, in a business model. Mm -hmm. Doing so well, you have a success, 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 that you're in articles, you are being sought after, after the best of the best. They, are, they want your model, you've done it well. And then you go off and open to others and something goes wrong. So what would be that, what's that pain point? What, I mean, what happened where, again, you're, I mean, you're the man. I mean, you know what you're doing. It's not like you're a rookie to this. Tremont was a rookie move. How is it that the other two failed? Well, I think, um, you know, I think I capitulated a little bit on the lease agreements. Um, that's why I don't do lease agreements anymore. That's why I have an awesome partner. Um, and we just didn't do the sales we needed to do. And I think we got a little aggressive and a little cocky. Um, I mean, I think that's what happened. It, um, you know, you sometimes believe and, you um, that you can do no wrong. And, you know, we definitely we just, I don't know. There's a lot of reasons. I mean, I certainly, as I said, I own this, like, this is my mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, I can look at it but it's really well now, years later. And I, and I was just thinking about this this morning. I was out lying. The most, we're, we're about to bring on this new HR team, which I'm really excited about. And I think it's really cool. And such an important part, the asset of the human, the humans, the people, and we have this woman who works with us and she's our director of training. She's my number one. That's her title, director of training. That's what she wants. Um, she can have any title she wants. She is so good at what she does. And so she runs the teams. And I just now, when I think about that in juxtaposition to Rouge and Kestrel, we running one restaurant's easy. It's this little thing, you know, and it's like, I'm there all the time. And, you know, just people know me, I know them, they know what to expect, I know what to expect. But when you get bigger and bigger, it's harder. And I think I was ill-prepared to what it meant to run multiple units. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, I repeated that mistake again. I know you don't want to go there, but I'm going to go there. Is that I opened up one and then two smoke shops, doing great. I opened up the third one, and it all started to crumble. We just started, like, we didn't have good systems. We didn't have good training. We mm -hmm. didn't have our director of training, you know, we just didn't. It took us about six months, three months to realize we had a major problem, three more months to bring on Amy and then get it going, you know, director of training. And then that, so what I'm trying to say is in retrospect, what went wrong? We were ill-prepared. We didn't know what we were doing. And this, if you, I think this is classic for chefs. They think they do one so they can do two and they think they can do two so they can do three. It's entirely different. I have two friends, two chef friends who you know, who are both like saying like, oh, you know, I'm, they're working to open multiple unit places. And I'm like, I, I saw that Chef Carla, uh, she's on TV. Yeah. I saw her talk about her restaurants and she goes, I was thinking about the 100th store before I opened up my first one.
and you got to open up that first one. You got to get your product, whatever that widget is, you got to develop it. And you got to make sure it runs well. And you got to make a little step back and make sure it runs without you because your, that's not your job anymore. If you're going to do multiple units. Yeah. That, um, I uh, have an advisor and I will, I mean, on our 10th anniversary, we're going in, we're in our 11th year right now. We were like, I go, yes, I go, we've made it 10 years. And he's like, he goes, no, you haven't. I'm like, I go, no, we've made it 10 years. We're, we're entering 11. And he's like, no, he goes, you're on year number one. Now you've made the mistakes. You know, the mistakes, you know how to hone into it. Now, you know what you do. Now you're starting your first year. And I'm like, oh, what a humbling moment when you hear something like that. So, so you were, you've, you've had Tremont, you had the two failures. Um, why did you decide to pivot into a new realm? I mean, yes, you got bored with the cooking or did you get to the point where you were just so disheartened by the two restaurants that you had and you just want to change dramatically and have a whole entire like uh, share moment where I'm like, I'm going to change my songs. Like what, what was it that moment where it's time to do something different? So, I mean, backing up, I had those other two restaurants. They opened and closed within a year, lost some money, went back to Tremont, just got back to my roots, rebuilt that business because it was kind of sl slipping a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that was probably year uh, five, six, seven. And so then I just built that, made it run really well. So I didn't have to be there that much. It ran well. I mean, I did good. About, yeah, year 18 or so, you know, I just – I just felt it was something time. I was time like, look, I'm 40, I think I'm like 48, 47. I just knew that this is the time to go for a run. If you're going to run, you know, this is the time, you know, I've already got, you know, I've gotten my master's, my PhD in restaurants, but now, you know, I take up my master's. Now I want to go get my PhD. So I want to go and really go big. And I don't mean physically big though. That is kind of what we're becoming. Um, I just wanted to go for it. I wanted to, I wanted to plan for my retirement. I wanted to build something. I, I wanted to do something multi-unit. You know, still, I love the food industry. I love it. It's, it's I love, but I love marketing. I love everything. So just decided to, it was time to do something. The funny part is what I was going, what I wanted. So I knew I, a realtor brought me in and he's like, I got a space for you. And I'm like, ah, I don't want to raise the money. I'm sick of it. And he's like, let's go talk to Brian. I'm like, oh, I know Brian. And I've known Brian for years. Just restaurant tours know each other. Mm -hmm. And we sat down and it was like him and the realtor bounced back and forth. Boom, boom, boom. Like this idea, this idea. And they're like, okay, this is the space. And he looks at me and goes, okay, you want to do this? And I'm like, wait, what? No, no credit check? No, nothing? And he's like, yeah, we'll just go for it. Um, I mean, we all obviously have contracts and, 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 and um, partnership agreements and all that stuff. Uh, but it was really kind of cool. Um, and which was nice because actually, as I talked to him later, I'm like, you never did kind of check on me. And he's like, I knew you. He goes, and I know you, I know who you are. I've been watching your career and with all the charity work I did and the community work I did and running a business, right, you know, you, you build a reputation. So reputation is very important. We were originally going to do an izakaya, a Japanese pub is what we were going to do. That is what I wanted to do. It begs the question, what do you know, Andy, about Japanese pubs? The answer is nothing. And um, arrogance, chefs are arrogant. That's an arrogant thought that I could just go to Japan, do some research and open a place. Uh, I'm sure I would have been okay. Would it have been a, a home run? No. And he looked at me, uh, my partner, and he goes, why aren't we doing, um, why aren't we doing barbecue? And I, we haven't mentioned this, but in my spare time for the last 20 years, I've been keep competing in barbecue competitions on weekends with my buddies. I was going to say, are these like the friend things? Like, where it's like, I go like, who can make the best barbecue? Who can make the best beer kind of situation? No, this is, so there's something called the New England Barbecue, uh, Northeastern Barbecue Society, NEBS.org. Okay. We compete under the Kansas City Barbecue Society rules, KCBS.org. No, no, okay. this is a big deal. This is, this is huge. I'm, I'm so I, so I see, I'm laughing. You're like, no, no, Joey, this is serious. So, well, tell me about serious because I'm thinking, okay. Let me, let me, let me tell you this. Let me together, tell you hanging out. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let me tell you something. Talking to me is like talking to Julian Edelman. I know not as good looking, but I am a member of the first non-Southern team to win the world championships of barbecue. Shut up. What? <laughs> 2009 Lynchburg, Tennessee, Jack Daniels Distillery. Our team, we're, we're head by a guy. We're, we're, I'm not the lead cook, so that's why I'm not. So I'm not the Tom Brady in this story. That's uh, Chris Hart, my best friend since high school. 
Uh, we have a barbecue team and we were awful in the beginning and practice and practice practice. We won Kansas City Royal out of 510 teams, first place brisket. Um, so we've been practicing for a long time. <laughs> All right. So this is a great way your high school friend, now we got Seattle kid, comes back here, goes to high school, 14 years old, loves to cook, meets this guy. When you guys were younger, did you guys do these things, kind of things? Or is it just like you guys have been friends for a long time and said, hey, let's start something? Oh, no. We used to, well, we used to party a lot. And at the parties, we would, you know, cook and do fun things. And we were always entertaining and always doing stuff. And, you know, he grew up in a very foodie family. In fact, that restaurant I told you about where I had the prime rib, um, his mother was a manager there and he was okay. a bartender there. Uh -huh. So we, you know, and, and also, by the way, he was my original partner at Tremont 647. Okay. So nice. he's actually, he's in tech now and he's been in tech for a long time. Um, like a coder, like, you know, higher up than a coder. But um, uh, so um, what happened was I bought him out of Tremont 647. He wanted to be more with his family. Mm -hmm. We didn't talk for about six months. And then we like kind of reached out and like, hey, there's a competition. We, de we had kind of seen one before. Let's just mm -hmm. do it. And we had a blast. We, we came in last. We had so much fun. And for five years, we kind of built a team. We built a team um, and uh, we just, we partied a lot. This was when we were younger and drank a lot and we tried to win. And we kind of all just, after five years, focused more and got better and better at it until we got really, really good at it. So you have been doing this competition for how many years before you started the restaurant? 15, 20 years. So now, all right, so now you're, it's, it's real. You know, you're, you have your recipe. Like people are gravitating towards you when you come to the competition, they know you're coming, they're excited. Yeah, and well, for years, it, I mean, especially in New England, it was, it was ours to lose. I mean, people knew that we would, if we, if we were there, that we were gonna win. That's awesome. That was, that was for years. Then, you know, you know, there's other great teams and they started to get really good. Mm -hmm. uh, after we won the world championships, we wrote a book on how we did it. And then people started beating us all the time, which was funny. Uh, and still, still, I mean, it's cool. Hey, I'm glad they bought the book. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, um, you know, Brian looked at me and goes, why aren't we doing barbecue? And I just didn't want to, uh, you know, um, how do they say it? Poop where you eat. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I love barbecue. So, um, you know, I don't know if I want to do that. And so I'm like, let me think about it. And there's another issue. And there's a technical issue. The best barbecue I can ever give you is straight out of the pit. You know, it comes out of the pit. It's, it's, it rests for 20, 30, 40 minutes, and then I give it to you. It's the best barbecue I can ever give you. How do I do that all day long? Mm -hmm. And so I really had to do some research. So I, came, I did some research. There's these magic ovens. They're called CVAPs. Uh, how do they work? Magic, basically, is best I can tell you. But they are created for Kentucky Fried Chicken to keep things crunchy and juicy. It's really, really cool. So I researched those, and then I thought a lot about the barbecue, talked to my buddies, and I went back to Brian, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. And so, uh, you know, our goal was to open up multiple units. And this was five years ago. And now we have opening up our fourth location uh, in two weeks during COVID. And, um, you know, and, I'm, and now I'm ready to open another one. Like, I'm going to start bugging them to do another one after this. And we'll probably do another one in 2021. Well, again, I'm going to rewind you for a bit. You start, yeah. You've been doing this competition. Barbecue is usually known as a summer I mean, summer, backyard, we're having a great time. Um, how did you get New Englanders to embrace it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365? Um, people love barbecue. Barbecue is comfort food. So it's comfort food. So I know it is seasonal in regards, and we see it on our sales. Um, <coughs> we certainly do more catering, um, you know, in the, in the spring and summer, fall. But... Um, we also do great sales during the fall and winter. Um, you know, we're a restaurant that provides really good food at a really good value and cold drinks. So, you know, one in one way, yes, and one way, no. You know, you're not right. It is also food that people like. It's comfort food. Um, I'm not going to lie. I, I love, love, love barbecue. I mean, like, like I, it's, it's not even funny. Look, there's not one time I go to the South where I'm like, I have to have it. I will find it. The second I started when you were, when you went live, I was helping promoting and everyone's like, you're promoting, but you haven't gone. I'm like, I know I'm the worst. I haven't gone yet, but I will always support you in whatever you're doing. Um, what did this pandemic do for you? So like you are now seeing the news coming down in March. Um, you're just like, you know, you're running your business. It's like starting, it's getting into your busier season. And then literally we all shut down. 
What did the yeah. pandemic do for you? Um, what did you do for us? Obviously, you're hearing all the news um, from all of your colleagues, all of your friends, all your partners, all your past people. Panic is setting in. At the beginning of this conversation, you said about how you, this was like a wonderful time for you. You just mentioned how you're opening up another restaurant. But what was it for you at the beginning? Well, in March was probably one of the hardest times. Um, I remember in February sitting in a meeting with some um, my managers going, I don't see how this doesn't hit us. Like, I'm like, how does this not hit us? And they're like, nah. And I'm like, listen, if someone says they're sick, they cannot come in. And, and then my, sometimes I get pushed back when my manager's like, yeah, but they're just, you know, saying they're sick. I'm like, I don't care. And you shouldn't care either, you know? And, um, you know, it was hard. What was really hard is basically we would, we were like, okay, sales are going to be um, 80% of, of, of budget. Okay, everybody redo. I'll call them back. We would call, call the managers later on that day, have another meeting and be like, no, they're going to be 70%. And they're like, but you, I'm like, this, this is so fluid right now. We don't even know. Just, and every day it was getting worse and worse and worse. And it just felt like we were running around putting out fires. I was thankful when the governor shut it down. It kind of stopped the mass bleeding. Like it was just, you know, like just pinprick after periphery bleeding everywhere. And we're just trying to figure it out and custom, you know, cancellations and on catering cancellations on, it was just chaos. It was absolute chaos. We knew the governor, I'd heard rumors. I'm a vice president of the Massachusetts Restaurant Association. So I'm hearing, you know, a lot of stuff. And um, we just um, basically ended up shutting it down, you know, um, and it was when he shut, he shut it down, we shut it down. And it was almost a reprieve, almost shell shock. And I could still have P, uh, PTSD. Like, I, I'm not sure. I would love you to ask me that question in a year. And in then another year. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes a lot of time to reflect on something when you've been in it and it's so intense. So that's, that's what it was like. What has it been since? So now, like, slowly but surely, shutting down, open... Yes. Shutting down, opening up. It's like literally the revolving door. Um, mm, nah. you... No. No. <laughs> so then, first of all, we started having Zoom meetings very quickly with all my managers once a week. And they were touching base with their teams. And we were trying to find out what their teams needed. Mm -hmm. And we found out very quickly that we had a lot of employees that were not collecting. About 50 of them. No money. Mm -hmm. And that is, in my that is not acceptable to me and that makes me sad if they can't eat they can't survive then i'm a not doing what i need to do as a leader yeah. so we quickly and it was just basically me one of my managers two of my friends volunteered and we went in and we so we took all the meats and frozen them you know froze everything we could gave to our staff to everything else okay and we said i started to do a pop-up and i didn't think it was going to be that big of a deal and it went from 10 orders to about 150 orders every week. We would sell them for about a hundred bucks each. And we got better and better at it. The first couple of weeks was really, very really hard, but we got really good at it. It was just us. Nobody came in the building. We you know, met them. We had this whole system, selling it online. Um, and um, we, uh, um, you know, we raised somewhere 15, $20,000. And then we were able to take, 75% of that and give that to all of those employees that couldn't collect. And these are checks anywhere from 500 to, you know, 200 to 600, depending on how long they've been with us, our whole formula, but it was something. It wasn't their full pay, but it was something. So they could, you know, get, they could live. You know what I mean? That's, and so we did that for weeks. And that whole time I kept talking to my management team saying, hey, you're going to come back soon. It's going to happen. And you'll, some of them were very scared. And I'm like, I'm going to tell you, it's going to look the same outside. The snow is not going to melt. And then we understand. It's going to look the same. You're going to come back. It's going to be okay. I will make sure you're going to be okay. What I was doing is two things. One, showing it was possible, not just for my team, but for the whole restaurant industry. And, and Joanne Chang partnered with me in this. We both wanted to show I don't know, we never really said it, but I felt that we wanted to show, hey, it's possible to open your businesses. It's possible to be creative. And then, you know, we've seen a lot of other people be really creative with really great ideas, awesome. We also want to show our teams, it's possible. 
We're not going to get sick. We're going to figure this out. We're going to do it right. So leadership. And then, of course, the, the donation, which is awesome, also got me out of the house because my wife's driving my wife crazy. Um, we started to do that. And then we brought on uh, takeout on um, uh, one day a week. And then we started brought on takeout two days a week. And then we started ramping up more and more, slowly transition those people out of the free money to actually where they had to come in and start working. Then we started, you know, we were, we were ready to go before we knew when the governor was going to say go. We were ready to go for our patios before they were ready, ready to go for the indoors. So we just slowly ramped working on budgets. We've been hitting or exceeding our budget budgets in a positive way. And we're doing okay. We will be fine. The biggest issue, mm -hmm. I just need to be very clear to me, this is my opinion, is landlords. One, landlords are not the bad guys. Mm -hmm. They have, look, they got a lease. It's yeah. a business document. They don't want to deal with you. They don't have to deal with you. You don't pay your rent, you're out. That's, that's, I'm sorry. That's just, it's awful to not like. No, no, not, you know what? I mean, I love that you're saying that because I have to sit there and whenever I, I'm hearing, again, you hear the negative news, I'm like, they have to pay someone too. You pay yeah. them, they have to pay something. It's not like they own the building or they own that property. So it, it is, a, it's a needed. Wait, what are you eating? Sorry. <laughs> I want to know what you're eating because, like, I mean, uh, okay, I, what is it? Almonds? It's, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> Ginger and soy vegetables. Oh, um, exciting. Okay. It's good. It's healthy food. <laughs> I'm just trying to do good. Uh, I'm sorry. It's my breakfast. I, I, I worked late last night and I, I need to. Um... No, I, hey, I, again, like I said to you, this is, this is not hard news. This is me coming from Percy, <laughs> but if there's something that's going to distract me, I'm calling you out. <laughs> Anywho, so um, where are we at? Oh, so, you know, it's landlords, right? So they need to, if you can, no one, most people cannot survive on pre-COVID rent. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. We partnered with our landlords. They were understanding. We we're able to come up with an agreement that made it so we could operate. We were not going to open with pre-COVID rent and then lose money. That's just what, that was our stance. And they're like, but we need to be paid. And we're like, that's of course. So we just figured it out so we can all get through this together. That was our deal. And now we're, we feel strong that we'll be able to get through this. And, and it's, it's, I, I'm going to believe, look, it, it, when 9-11 happened, I was crushing it. I was doing so great. I'm making a lot of money. I had a personal assistant. I had all this stuff, extra fat that I didn't need. I learned very, that during 9-11, I learned like, wow, what, what, well, how temporary that is, you know, and how that you need to be prepared. And and I've never operated in a uh, in a in a in a heavy way. Never operated with luxurious stuff again, yeah. you know. And I know restaurateurs who've never had to go through this, something like this, and it's hard. And you gotta I, just you gotta figure it out. Well, I love that you just said like you work together with a with your landlord. So many people are running scared. Go for it. Hold on a second. The person that wants to come by? Okay, okay. I'm on a Zoom. My mother, she's saying hi. Hi, Mom. <laughs> hi. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. No, not even close. Go ahead. I love it. <laughs> You're talking about how. Um, uh, communication with your landlords. So many people are running scared. They're hiding from their landlords. They're, they just don't know how to have that conversation. Yeah. There are some ideas and thoughts of like, how do you open up that conversation? I mean, 9-11 prepped you for running leaner, um, yeah. smarter, but a lot of people, you just said it, a lot of people have no idea how to even navigate through this. This is their first time. So what, what kind of conversation do you have, have with a landlord, not yours particularly, but any landlord on what's the best way to stay in survival mode? I mean, I think you, I mean, I think you just got to kind of come up with, so the way restaurants work are percentages, okay? If you run a million dollar restaurant, do a million dollars in gross sales, your, la your labor is going to be about 30%. If you do 5 million in gross sales, your labor is going to be about 30%. Mm -hmm. Food cost should be about 30 or, or cost of goods should be about 30%. Okay. So everything's broken down. This is traditional history of a restaurant. There's flexibility, but that's basically it. So your rent should be somewhere between six and 8%. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Yeah. That's your answer, right? You 
could say, well, look at my, look, maybe, maybe you have enough money. You say like, I cannot be paid. I can stop being paid. So therefore I can maybe increase my rent a little bit or whatever you need to do, but you need a certain amount of labor to run a business. You need a certain amount of food to run. You need insurance, you need electricity. All those are points, right? So you've got to, and you should have a little bit of profit, a little bit. Why are you doing it? If not, that's, this is a business, right? So somehow you figure it out with the landlord. It's like, you can be, I would be candid. I would be candid and open and say, this is what we need to survive. But losing money, and this is where if a landlord can't be flexible or does not want to be flexible, then um, the landlord doesn't want to be or, or can't be, or for whatever reason, then that's the reality. Then you have to look at it, put it together a spreadsheet and go, can I survive on this type of rent? Should be a pretty easy answer because we don't know how long this goes for. Which is the next, the next revenue, the, the re next um, uh, group of questions. Where we don't know how long this is going to be. What do you see happening? The weather is changing. Um, everyone had the Jersey barriers out. They had their parking lots. They had. They were yeah. creative ways to be outdoors. Thank God we didn't have as much rain. Um, right usual. Right um, yeah. But it's the weather's changing. I mean, this this week in itself, it's the weather's changing. Uh, what happens? not only in Massachusetts, but what do you think the restaurant industry in, a, in its whole will look like next year? This is funny. Someone just asked me this last night. If you had asked every restaurant tour a year ago and said, what's, what's your biggest problem? Most of them would have said, too many restaurants. There's just too many restaurants. Too many liquor licenses. Too many restaurants. Look where we are. Look at that. Not, um, yeah. What's going to happen? I don't know. And I'm, I, listen, I'm not cavalier about this. I'm very, these are my friends, my family, my brothers, my sisters in the hospitality industry. I do not want to see anybody close. I do not want to see anybody lose money and I will help them. However, I personally can. Um, but it is, restaurants are going to close and that's going to happen. But you know, what's funny. So restaurants were so famous, right? But what about the what about the masseuses? What about the hair salons? What about all the other businesses that are having? This is a big deal to a lot of people, and I feel for everybody, and it sucks. Um, I think I think I'm hoping that you know those that are going to be around are going to hunker down and figure out how to get through the winter. We're certainly looking at budgets. We've got plans. Um, has to do with you know uh, you know we're gonna probably have to sh you know so we're lucky because we're opening another place. We'll be able to ship some people. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get. The people we have now are our core people, and I love my employees. Um, but um, so I don't know. We'll, we'll see see what what happens. But we're going to lose some. I mean, that's what everybody's saying, and that's going to happen. And I think once we get through this, I'm hoping from what I read that some maybe some kind of roaring twenties happens. You know that people are pumped and excited. You know, and there's kissing in the streets, and you know everything. Like everybody's just excited, and I hope that you know. We'll come back bigger, stronger. I have friends that believe the restaurant industry will change. The model will change. Great. I don't personally think it's going to change. I think there'll be some changes. Um, hoping there's more hand washing. That'd be fantastic. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll see. I think, I think we'll see some ch changes and some not, you know. I saw a McDonald's in the airport the other day. There was a kiosk and nobody worked. You just ordered your food and put a credit card in. I watched, I mean, I watched someone do it. And I was like, oh, that's neat. You know, so, <laughs> Maybe I need one of those kiosks. That's what I need. I, I you know what? I would take that. Uh, all right. Mm -hmm. I, have t I have two more questions. Yeah. Uh, during this time, you've been at home. You have twins. Yes. How has it been at home? Because you're usually uh, moving so fast. You're usually <laughs> building up businesses. You are speaking. You are doing so much. You have a family. And it was an instant bigger family. So how is it at home with the twins? Uh, I have two-year-old twins, yeah. And also in the beginning of COVID, because we were like, you know, I'm canceling my, you know, my Pandora service or my Spotify service. We're canceling everything. You know, we don't need it. We get it because we weren't sure what was going to happen, right? Yeah. I just did not know when I have a job again. Um, that was like the first week. And my wife, who is a uh, has a marketing um, consulting firm, uh, works with magazines. Um, they love her, and they're like, "Do you want more work?" She's like, "Yeah." And um, so that meant I took the babies on uh, during the day when I would normally be working. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a challenge and it was fun and exciting and um, a lot of running with my girls and playing outside. And, you know, I, 
I talked to another chef friend of mine about the about two weeks in, and he was like, you know, none of us, none of us chefs have ever taken that kind of time off. Yeah. It's hard because there was a dark cloud, and I don't like um, not knowing what's going to happen. You know, a vacation's different. You know you're coming back. But here we were insured. But still, in the moment, it was beautiful that I got to do that. So it's been great. My, my daughters are awesome. They're two and a half years old, and Millicent and Esther, and they are fantastic. So it's, how has it been? I, yeah, I don't know. I'm happy to have each other because I haven't been able to play with anybody else. So it's nice to have each other. And uh, my mother who just popped in is here. And so my mother gets to see them a lot. And I think it's just, uh, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. What, what have you added outside of the restaurant that you're adding on? What have you added that you would have not done or um, you would have done in the future because you have the abundance of time? For you. I don't have abundance of time. Uh, <laughs> I never have time. Um, not much. I mean, I don't know, not, nothing really. I mean, my life's the same. I, I, I work a lot. And when I'm not working, I'm with my family. And those are my choices. So not, nothing really. Uh, you know, I, I wish I could add a good answer for you, but no. No, you know what? That's a good answer. I mean, that's a great answer. Because um, I tell people all the time, I mean, everyone's like, you're always working. Because I get up at 425 and I start working, but I go for a run. I mean, I, I live, you know, and I live in Marblehead. I mean, I go for my runs. Yeah. I watch the sunrise every single morning. It makes me happy. Um, but yeah, it's like, it's, it's, how, it's how you're balancing things. Last question, because I know you're busy, but and the twins are probably needing you. If you had a personal and professional ask to ask of anyone that's listening to you right now, what would be your personal and your professional ask of anyone that's listening? Great question. And I'm, I'm not going to have one answer. I'm going to have a bunch of answers. I bring uh, it on. Bring it on. If you want to learn to cook, if you're interested in barbecue or anything, buy my books. Uh, a- Andy Husbands on Amazon. My latest book is about the premise is nobody cooks a brisket for themselves. So it talks about food and how we cook it. Barbecue is the friendliest food. It is the food of celebrations, family gatherings, graduations. So check out my books. If you like barbecue, we wrote how we won the world championships. You can learn that too. in wicked good barbecue. I've got a bunch of books. Uh, follow me on Instagram at Andy husbands. I would love that. Interact with me. I love seeing when people cook out of my book. I love seeing anything you want to tell me. I love to hear it. And uh, come by and visit me. I'm at the restaurants. Love to make you a rib, a wing, some brisket. Love to see you. Especially you, Jody. Love I know. I know. I, like, I'm, 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 you know what the thing is? Like, I started, it's not like I was afraid to go out. I mean, I'm just comfortable. I mean, I'm very comfortable yeah. right where I am. And we created a, a nice little bubble. So I didn't have to go. But I am going up and about now and hanging out and, and I'm just sending gifts. I'm like, I'm, I'm surprising friends with gifts. So I may have to sit there and surprise friends with gifts. Like, well, what are your hours right now? Um, about mostly uh, 12 to nine, right around there. 12, nine, 12 to 10. All right. So I, I'm going to, I most likely will check in with you afterwards, but I'm going to probably surprise a friend next weekend with your stuff. I would love that. Let me know. So, so that's good. All right. So wait, what's your, per- what's your personal ask? Oh, I don't know. Be good to each other. There you go. I'll take that. And yeah. thank you so very much for taking time. And I took more time from you because I needed to talk to you more, but I love thank, thanks so very much. I mean, I, I mean, one, I love, I love what you're doing. I mean, I've always supported you. I will continue to support you. You're fantastic. Um, I love how you're growing and thinking so much more out of the box, but I even love more. You're no longer just a teacher. It's like you're the principal of the school. So <laughs> you are, I mean, you, Vice principal. <laughs> yeah, you used to be inside, you used to be in the mix of everything. Um, and now just being on the outside where the marketing, the branding, the, share, the sharing of the story, um, making sure that the next generation of chefs are learning from you and so many other chefs, because sometimes People just don't want to share their knowledge and they die with it. And you have stopped when you could have kept on going for quite some time and you're continuing to find ways to teach and be better. So I appreciate you. I appreciate anyone that goes out of their way to share their legacy. So bravo to you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I love it. You're so very welcome, my friend. Thank you so very much. And I'm going to check in with you guys. So when you just said check in with me in a year, I'm checking at the end of the year, start of the year to make sure everyone is doing okay. Sounds good to me. All right. Thank you, darling. Thank you. Hi, can I help you? Uh, pick up for Mike. Let me check. Uh, yes, can you 
please? Sure. And use this dog, please. Thank you very much. You Appreciate it.